You've just landed Inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further faster in this crazy cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. Hey there, innovators. Tamara here, your host and the person that, believe it or not, never hits snooze. I don't know. Someone once told me that hitting the snooze button is like starting your day procrastinating and that it shows up then in the rest of your day and you just procrastinate all day long. So I stopped hitting snooze, which is crazy because I get up at 4 a.m. I either get up, which is what I do most of the time, or I just go back to bed. No in between. Okay. So today we have another special podcast. One of your fellow launch streeters, Jonah Granger, he works for a large global, actually, snack food company, asked such a good question that I actually bumped it up in the list. He asked, is there such a thing as too much collaboration? I know it totally feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? I think it's such a good and relevant question for most of us. We're supposed to be collaborative. We know we're supposed to involve people. Yet sometimes it feels like we're just swimming it. We never get anything done. So here's the short answer to Jonah's question about too much collaboration. The short answer is yes, and I'll dig into that in the podcast. I think what's actually happening, and we'll talk about this, is that we're falling into the consensus trap, and that's where ideas go absolutely nowhere. We also talk about why being vulnerable is part of collaborating and how to stop getting ideas and move on to decision-making at the right moments. We also talk about what people really need in the collaboration process, and I will give you a hint. It's not for their ideas to move forward. I know, shocking. All right, let's do this. <laughs> All right, everybody. Tamara here on Launch Street. Clearly... Um, ready for a ridiculous conversation as we always have. I'm here with the amazing Connie Warden. So, hey, Connie. Hey, I am so glad to be here. And it's already started off to be a lot of fun. <laughs> There's some stuff we're going to have to cut out for sure. Yeah. But listen, so we're here today because we want to talk about one of the questions that we got in here at Launch Street from Jonah Granger. He's from a large company, Snack Food Business, which is a fascinating business, actually. I used to do a bunch of work in there, and it's just the the thought that goes into the branding and when people eat, it's actually really amazing. But Jonah asked a really important question. He said, is there such a thing as too much collaboration? Which And it's a good question. Yeah, isn't it though? Because I think, yeah. don't you find that sometimes we're so busy, like, oh, we have to collaborate, we have to collaborate, we have to collaborate, and then we don't get anything done. done. Have you yeah. ever been in that situation? Oh, yes. I did that at Merrill Lynch. We did that uh, with a group of a team. And it was ridiculous. Finally, somebody had, to, of course, come up and make some decisions. <laughs> and, you know, I think that part of what happens is, and I'm not sure if this is your experience at Merrill Lynch, but I know I've seen this time and time again, is I think we confuse collaboration with consensus, and consensus, I think, is where ideas go to die and where they get watered down and where you never get to decision because you're busy trying to get everybody's input all the time. Yeah. And it just that doesn't work. No. And what you see in politics. Why do you, what did you say? It gets you into politics? <laughs> We can see that in politics. Oh, you see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Like yeah. we're trying to appease everybody all the time. I, I'm curious, like, why do you think that ideas become so watered down in consensus? Before I answer the question, I kind of want to start there and, and unpack a little bit of why they're different and why there's a problem. Okay. Go ahead. Well, tell me what you think. Oh. Why, what do you think waters down ideas? Why does consensus not work? Let me, let me put it that way in your experience. Because somebody doesn't want to take the responsibility of making decisions. Do you think that's just too, like it's too scary to be the one who owns it? Yeah. 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 Because there's always the fear that it's not going to work. It's not the right decision. You know, it's so interesting to me too, because I've always come from the place of as long as you make a decision, you're better off than not. In fact, frankly, not making a decision is the same thing. And I think it is a decision just in a different way. I think yeah. oftentimes with the companies I've worked with and in my own teams, when we've gotten almost bogged down in consensus, um, it's because we're told, well, everybody needs to have a seat at the table everybody. And then you start including people who don't have the right 
perspective, experience, part of their job description. Now, I'm not saying that ideas don't come from anywhere. We're going to talk about that in a second. But I am saying that not everybody has to be at the table all the time. And when we do that, it's just this never-ending vicious cycle. So I want to propose a different definition of collaboration. So here's my definition. And I think, Connie, we've worked on this a little bit together. And we've actually kind of seen this in action with some of the workshops we've done together. Um, To me, collaboration is the right people at the table talking about the right things at the right time. So let me say it again, because I think there's three elements to that. One is the right people at the table. So that's, in my opinion, people with perspective, influence, um, experience that can be beneficial. And the influence one is interesting to me because I think people always forget those people, the ones who can actually influence how it gets implemented. So that's the right people at the table. I think talking about the right things, that's making sure you're actually talking about the right problems, right challenges, right opportunities, and also at the right time. Not everything needs to be dealt with all the time. It's kind of like your to-do list, right? Like the to-do list is 10 pages long, but if you really looked at it, there's probably three things on there you need to do at that time. Especially the one thing. Yeah. Right. yeah. Have you read that book? That's such a good book, by the way. It really yeah. is. Yeah. For yeah. those of you out there listening, it's called The One Thing. And um, I can't remember the Nate guy's name now. It's the William Keller Paint Store. And the whole thing is what's the one thing you can do today that makes everything else um, inconsequential, easier, or something like that. It's game changing. Yeah. But I think collaboration is the same way. Like, let's get the right people at the table at the right time talking about the right things. Right. And why is that so hard? Why is I that so it, hard? Yeah, I, I think because you're, they're unaware that this is really important, bringing the right people at the right time. Do you think that's a fear of leaving people out and, and the repercussions of how people feel for not being invited? Oh, I think so. I think there's a lot of that. Oh, that's so interesting to me. So what do you think? Let's flip it for a second. What do you think is the flip side to that? Like, What happens when you get the right people at the table? How do you know? That's a really good question. And maybe because there's a, a good energy that happens when they're talking. I wonder, too, I love what you're saying. And I wonder, as, as you're saying that, it got me thinking, also, you attack the challenge or the opportunity from all different perspectives. So you let's say there's five of us that collaborate together, and you've got the operations perspective, I've got the sales perspective, they've got the marketing perspective. I think when you bring all those things together together, it's like storming the castle. Like you can feel that it, it's all yeah. coming together, but from different perspectives versus everybody at the table, for example, either having the same perspective or a bunch of people at the table who have no perspective, but try anyway to include because you've asked them to be there. And I think it's, I'm going to turn the coin a little bit for a second and say that I think it's really an interesting juxtaposition because on one hand, collaboration is the right people at the right time, right? Talking about the right things. On the other hand, I think we know that great ideas can come from anywhere. So I kind of like to think of it as at the front end of ideation, challenge solving, whatever you want to call it, you cast a crazy wide net and you gather as much input as you possibly can. It's like the open phase, right? Everyone contributes. Then you go to the collaboration phase, which is what we were just talking about, which is really about then you call it down to the right people talking about it at the right time, going through all the ideas. And then there's obviously the feedback loop of sharing what you've kind of learned from everyone and where you're headed. But I think if you can create that process of starting with open-ended, casting a really wide net, and I'll share a story with you in that in a second, getting to that tighter knit collaboration and then getting to decision and buy-in, you can actually see ideas go forward. I love that. First of all, that open phase is so important. And I, I see you with all the little notes, sticky notes <sighs> that you've done with other companies all over the room, right? <laughs> There's the open phase. Yeah. But that, that, that uh, and collaborating and then making decisions, yeah. that's where uh, instead of consensus, we're talking collaboration and somebody coming with a decision moving forward. Well, and I think to kind of bring it, not full circle, but kind of circle back to what we were just talking about, and I think the way you said that was so brilliantly articulated, that open phase where you cast a wide net is as many people as possible that can give you perspective. The challenge, this is, it just kind of occurred to me as you were talking, the mistake that we make is then we bring all those people with us through the collaboration phase, and that's when we it, it turns from collaboration to consensus and where things start to get really bottlenecked and just beat down. You know, I was... um 
behind stage with the chief innovation officer of a major, major fast casual or casual, I should say, restaurant um, that's based here in Colorado, but has them all over. And he said to me, like, when is it enough collaboration? Like, when can I just move on? Which is kind of like Jonah's question of like, when can I just get to decision making? I think the mistake that happens in particularly in large companies or large teams is we cast that wide net, which is awesome, but then we try to bring them all with us moving forward. They're fine. Let them go back to their jobs. Go collaborate. Tell them what you learned and what you're decided to do, but they don't need to come with you for the entire journey. They're not the right people. Right. And thank them. Thank you for all your ideas. We'll see how we're going to put these together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's even like with kids, you know, I mean. I know you want to play, son, but and I see you're upset, but you're going to the grocery store. <laughs> that's my that's the conversation in my house every week. I get it. I understand we can throw the football five times. Yeah. Then we gotta go run some errands. Yes. Because I think it's important that people be seen yeah. for their ideas. You know, and, and say, you know, thank you. You know, these are great ideas, but we're gonna move on and we'll share with you what we found. And don't you find this has been my experience. That if you, uh, let's say you ask a lot of people for input in something, a challenge, opportunity, idea, and then you go and you then do your thing with a collaboration with the right people at the table, that if you simply do the simple act of letting them know, hey, we heard all your ideas, thank you, and here's we're going to go this direction, and here's why. I, I, I find that if you do that, people are feel trusted, they feel heard. It's not a matter of people need you to go with their idea. It's that they need to understand why you're doing what you're doing and that their idea, if nothing else, was heard and valued. That's all. I Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, I don't work in a a corporation anymore, but I feel sorry sometimes for people because, you know, it's so busy and fast paced and they don't get thanked and they just want to be seen. Wouldn't it be nice too if all those people? What I've just to bring it to like almost an organizational case study. What I find is, you know, big companies are full of amazing people. They're full of a lot of frontline staff and people out in the field who are connecting with customers day to day, whether that's in the grocery stores, at the service counters, on the phone with people. Yet they're the ones who are not asked for their opinion. So all this collaboration or all these ideation is happening at corporate, but they're not including people on the front lines who live it every day. And I'm going to share a really kind of tangent example of this, but I think it actually, it kind of relates back to this. So um, I can't remember where I first heard this story, but basically there's this, this manufacturing company in Japan and they notice that every hour there's a glitch in the line, in the, in the system. They can't figure out why just every hour, the product's coming out with a slight uh, malfunction And they've tested the equipment, they've brought in the engineers, they've done all this stuff to try to figure out what is going wrong and why they're losing, you know, millions of dollars in product that keep become that are faulty. And um, there's a janitor. And every day the janitor, when everything else closes down, goes in and cleans, and then he goes to the train, which is about a mile away, and he takes it home there and back to the to the factory. And one day he's standing on the platform. And he's noticing that the ground's starting to rumble a little because the train's coming. And it occurs to him, oh my gosh, the train comes every hour on the hour. That's why there's a fault in our product. That slight vibration, something that we as humans can't detect a mile away, but is messing with the precision, is actually what's causing the problem. So this is a guy who, he's on the front line, he's in the factory every single day, but nobody thought to ask him. But he's the one who had this brilliant revelation of, aha, this is why we have the problem. All the engineers, all in the equipment, couldn't figure it out. And then there's this janitor standing on a tram platform who's like, oh, wait a minute. Sure enough, that was the problem. They figured out how to solve it. But to me, it's all getting the in that open section, getting all those people on board and getting their input before you then get the engineers and those people together to actually collaborate and fix the problem or do whatever. That's, to me, the key of great collaboration. It's going really wide and then bringing it narrow. And that takes open-mindedness mm. because we have to value those people just as much as management, uh, CEOs, and we tend to not. Why do you think that is? That's so painful, isn't it, to think that – It really is. Like the people who – they get paid the least, right? Let's just call it what it is on the scale, <laughs> yet they are full of interesting ideas and solutions because they're on the front line all the time. Yes. Brene Brown, you know, our, our, our favorite person. Yes, I know. We talk about her like every podcast. <laughs> 
<laughs> we love you, Brene. <laughs> she talks about that, about how the people that are the servers – are the ones that are so unseen. And she has mm. this whole section on how sad that is that we don't see. I, I remember a, a friend of mine, she decided to make some extra money and she did some catering. And she says, the minute I put on my uniform, I became unseen by everybody. Wow. Isn't that sad? Yeah. And think, imagine for a moment, if you're in that space how unvalued you feel and how uninterested you probably are in helping the business move forward. Why yeah. would you? Nobody's valuing you to begin with. Correct. Yet yeah. you're doing the heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Oh, that hurts. Just a little bit right here, Connie. Just a little oh, bit I right know. here. I know because who has, I mean, I hope everyone's been a server in some capacity. You know, I mean, I was in the sky. I love your airplane stories. I bet there are just, I mean, I see customers acting ridiculous. I have no doubt that you have these incredible stories. And you know what? I'm glad you brought that up because I think it speaks to a bigger challenge that we have in our teams and the people we work with is we tend to hold some people up on this pedestal as being the, oh, they're the innovators, right? They're amazing. Let's bow down to them. Let's just wait for them to, you know, spew their brilliance on us. That sounded disgusting after I said it out loud, but we're leaving it in. The way I was like, wait a minute, that didn't sound right at all. Um, But that's what we wait for, right? And the rest of us just wait with our notepads, eager to, you know, take in all the brilliance they're going to give us. Yet we're all innovative in some way. I mean, you and I, you've taken our assessment, the innovation portion ads. You're innovative. I'm innovative. We just do it a little bit differently. That's all. We all do it differently, which is a brilliant thing at the end of the day because that's multiple perspectives. But I think to your point about like some people being devalued, it's, Partially because I think on the flip side, we put the innovators on a pedestal and we say, oh, well, they're the special ones. They're unique. They're the ones who will like come up with the crazy ideas. And the rest of us are supposed to just, I don't know, sit in the shadow and wait. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, that's why being open-minded and being, when you're on that open stage, yeah. bring in everybody. Well, you never know. So I'll give you another funny story because this just reminded me. It came to my head. I love podcasting because I will tell you, Connie, that people will will say something and I will suddenly get this vivid memory of like some event in my life <laughs> that came up. But um, years ago, I was working in – I was right after college. I worked on Madison Avenue in advertising and that was back in the day when a- Madison Avenue – mattered. It doesn't anymore. It's not the same kind of like those ad agencies rule the world the way it did. But but that's what it was. I was at YNR, Young and Rubicam, which was the second largest global, I think, at the time. And I was low on the totem pole. I was pole. just going to go, wow, Tamara, that's amazing. Thank you. I was low on the totem pole. <laughs> the lowest you could possibly get, actually. <laughs> I just mean account management. Low. And see, there you go. So, and everybody knows that hierarchy, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was like we were all shoved up on the, I think it was the 12th or 21st floor. I can't remember now, but in these like hideous cubes, all of us 20 year olds shoved together, which is his own mistake, by the way. Just if you're I out there with even, a bunch of yeah. 20 year olds, don't put them all together. But, uh, you know, here's the thing, right? So I, I, I was fortunate enough to work with a team of people who recognized that they should mentor and support the lowest person on the totem pole. So if I was lucky, I got to sit in on meetings and not say a word. That was my role. Nice. Right? And, and to me, that was better than what most people were doing my age and in that role. So for me, that was a step up. And then they gave me the responsibility of putting together – the logistics of the biggest meeting of the year with the client and the creative. So you've got account management. So we're like the babysitters. And then you've got, right, your creatives who do all the ads and whatever. So uh, Steve was the name of our big creative guy. And he was the one we put up on the pedestal. So, you know, everybody kind of shuffles into this conference room. I'm super nervous because I'm responsible for this thing going off without a hitch, right? So all of my senior leads come in, the client drives in from upstate New York, like, Big deal. Everybody's there, but damn Steve. So oh no! Now and this is before cell phones. It's the '90s, right? Just to age myself. Oh I'm, wait, there was a time before I cell know, phones, right? Like I had to pick. I had to have his phone number somewhere, <laughs> and then I had to pick up a phone and call him. So I did that, and I'm calling. I'm calling. I'm calling. He was supposed to be there at eight. Eight fifteen's rolling around. Eight thirty. Now I am sweating through my Ann Taylor matching red one piece outfit. <laughs> And I'm right. That's my power suit. And I'm dying like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Because without Steve, there's no way we can craft our creative strategy for the year. That's what we were trying to do was like this was the day, right, to set all days up for everything. And he doesn't show. And 
nine o'clock rolls around. I finally get him to pick up the phone and he goes, oh, I'm not feeling well. So I thought I would ditch and hangs up on me. That's it. So now oh. I'm stuck and it's me and the client and it's account management, some people in media buy, some media and people in sales. And there's, I'm sitting there and I say, well, here we go. And that's all I say. And then there's dead silence in the room because we all expected Steve to do the, the creative work for us, the heavy lifting, right? He, that was him. And then about, it's felt like a hundred minutes. I'm sure it was like 90 seconds, but suddenly someone from media buy piped in with an idea and then someone from accounting and then someone from account management. And suddenly all these brilliant nuggets of gold, these people who think about this business all the time, but have never been asked are coming up with all these brilliant creative ideas. And eventually by the end of the day, we had a brilliant creative strategy, brilliant. And Steve had nothing to do with it. And it was my first lesson to what you were saying about when you cast that net it is amazing the ideas that come out that, you know, our people are thinking about all the time, but we never ask them for. And it's not the people you think it's going to be. Yeah, that's a great story. Steve. Yeah, I'm <laughs> still mad at him. Well, I hope Steve learned a lesson. Yeah, well, he, be- he became a slightly less valuable on the team that day, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Nice story. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because um, Steve was really frustrated on the back end, but he didn't show up, right? So, but but again, the lesson to me is, oh my gosh, cast a wide net of people who have a perspective and interest and influence in what you're doing. And it's amazing what you get. And then what happened was the right thing. Then the creative lead and the account lead and the client, the three of them went off and did the collaboration side with the right people at the right table. Um, and that was amazing for me to see like w- what a good collaboration process really looked like. And then they looped back and said, hey, everyone, thank you. Here's what we're going with and here's why. And it was just, it was absolutely brilliant. But I think something else happened that day, Connie, that I want to talk about with you, uh, because I know you've got some experience around this. It was actually at a little bit of a deeper level. And that is, without Steve in the room, people felt willing to put themselves, their ideas and their vulnerability out there. They were afraid of Steve because we had put him up on this pedestal. And he's the creative one. So anything they say is not going to live up to what he could come up with. Without him in the room, suddenly we all had permission to say those things we've been thinking about. Isn't that, I just think that is such a uh, poignant example that they held him up as a, on a pedestal. And then I wonder also about how much we work on our self-image. Mm. And True. If, you know, instead of, you know, they were going to be quiet because if they were going to bring out an idea, maybe they would be looked at as silly or whatever. And I think we work sometimes too much on our self-image rather than what is authentically within us to have it come out. So are you saying that maybe we filter what we're going to say, judge what we're going to say, or our, our thinking before we even get it out there because we're more concerned about how are they going to perceive it versus what's – let me just get this idea out. Here's what I'm thinking. Let me talk about it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think we need to bring awareness to that. Mm. You know, what are, what are we working on? Are we, you know – so I had this funny story. Do you mind me doing my ninja story? Oh, my God. I, I was about to ask you. So for those of you listening, I want you to know that Connie, <laughs> first of all, she's tiny. Like if I stood next to her, you'd be like, who is that giant and that tiny little person next to her? And But you're a full-fledged ninja. And just explain that because when I say ninja, I don't mean like you watch ninja movies and like you can throw some nunchucks. Like you're a ninja. Yes, I, I did spend a few years. Um, well, I, actually, I spent 12 years doing martial arts. Amazing. And I did three and a half years doing ninjutsu. And yes, we did things with that exactly the ninjas did. We actually went into a camp. We actually took over a whole campground and spent the weekend doing things there, throwing our, our uh, darts and trying to um, uh, – creep up on other people oh like the samurai <laughs> serious we had the samurai too can you walk without making any sound oh yes oh my gosh oh yeah yeah it was it is, it's very interesting and so i was i was coming to this time i knew it was going to be a, a a very traumatic thing for me i was going to turn 40 Ooh. right so i decided for some reason that if i could still do a back handspring that uh, turning 40 would be okay. Ah, because you'd still be young. You'd still yeah. be flexible and strong. Yeah. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would go to my daughter's gymnastics. Wait, had you ever been able to do one before? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I kind of grew up doing gymnastics, okay. and I don't know why. And we did a lot of kind of calisthenic things in ninja, yeah. in ninjutsu. And so I decided – anyway, so I went to my daughter's gymnastics, and sure enough, I learned how to do a back handspring. And so one day I got this call from my ninja teacher. I'm thinking he's going to invite me to the, the Japan uh, mm. conference. Yes. But no. No. He wants me to be a ninja at his seven-year-old <laughs> – son's birthday party. Oh my God, get out. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, all right, you know, fine. At least I can do a back handspring. I can use it somewhere. Right. right. So I get dressed up and I, you can't see anything about me, but my mouth. Right. Cause we actually did wear black uniforms and I had my sunglasses on. And so I go to the birthday party and I don't say a word, right. Because as soon as I say a word, they're going to know I'm a female. Right. So I'm just beating up the kids and I'm being all ninjutsu like and doing back handsprings. And there was this one kid, man, he just he wanted to know who I was. He wanted me to take my mask off. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take the mystery. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I kept beating him up, you know. And um, so finally I leave. I go to my car. It's about a block away. And I take my mask off. And there's this little kid from around my car. He looks up at me. He points a finger and he says, oh my God, it's an old lady. Oh, that's like and a I stab like, in the heart. Yeah, a stab to the heart is right. I'm like, I'm 40 and I can do a back handspring. And you see me as an old lady. Right. And I just thought, you know, Aww. I've been working on my image and, and not on my, on what's really important. And, and who I am. Anyway, it taught me a good story. And then after I went over the, um, oh, poor me, I'm he yeah. thinks I'm an old lady. Who cares what a seven-year-old thinks, right? It's funny that seven-year-old thinks 40 is old. Like <laughs> nowadays, we live to our 100. That's like not even half your life. But I love that story, Connie, because I've heard it before and I, I don't get enough of it every single time because to me, it is really a great example of you were focused on the wrong thing. And that I, I would venture to say, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you were an awesome birthday ninja, but had you not been worrying about, well, people know I'm an old lady, <laughs> you know, you I probably don't. actually would have been even more present and more able to do whatever it is and be in the moment than you were in that because that layer is always on you. And I think in innovation, it's very much the same way as your ninja of we're so afraid that if we pull off the mask and the, the costume that people will see what's really inside. And what, what's really inside for most of us is we have no idea what the fuck we're talking about half the time. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but that's, that doesn't mean my ideas or my thinking is any less valid, but we tend to see it as that way. You know what? And, and that's true. Cause so there's two things there. First of all, we yeah. hide behind something. Yeah. Whatever, whatever we fear may not appear like we know it all. Mm -hmm. And Brene Brown on her newest book, she talks about that. Is that Braving the chapter. Wilderness? Is that the – Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, call off, you know, call bullshit, but yeah. be nice. Yeah. And, um, and so we can say, I don't know, but what do you think of this idea? You know, um, I don't care if I'm, if I'm 40 or 7. Well, there and you go. Sometimes I find that with the ideas that – when it comes to innovation, sometimes what you say makes no sense at all. And sometimes there's something brilliant in there and you've just got to spend some time on it. And if you put those layers on it, those that side of it, the stuff that's brilliant, but just it's messy, right? It's not clear. Maybe it's not – doesn't sound polished. The best nuggets of gold are in there. But if we put those layers on it, we don't get it out. So, Or we try to adjust it to make it sound smarter and – I can't remember if I told the story last time you and I talked about college and not feeling like I was smart enough. I think we talked about that in the last oh, one. Yeah. 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 I think that's in the last podcast, in the last one. I, I can't remember. But I just, you know, when you're so busy trying to be the smartest person in the room, you sound like the biggest idiot. That's what I learned. Yeah. And um, you learned the hard way. Oh, my God. Because I was <laughs> the biggest idiot in the room. I'll have to go back and make sure I share that story because if not, I'll, I'll find a time to share it again. But yeah. um, to, you know, kind of close up this Q&A session. So first of all, Jonah, thank you for asking about collaboration. And I think as you can tell, while our conversation has been a little bit all over the place, in a lot of ways, that's what collaboration really looks like. It's a little bit messy. It's not always clear. But I would say that if you yes, there is too much collaboration sometimes. Actually, let me rephrase that. There isn't too much collaboration. When you're feeling like that's the case, you've actually moved to consensus and you have moved away from real collaboration, the right people at the table at the right time talking about the right things. 
And I would say, Jonah, if you follow the four phases, so phase one being open, gathering input from everybody, casting that wide net, allowing, I think what Connie and I have really been talking about right now is giving people permission to bring those ideas and be vulnerable and, and share those things with you is the first phase. The second phase is that right people at the table at the right time, the real collaboration. The third phase, I think, is that feedback loop that we alluded to of like, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's why. Thank you. Like feeling valued and heard, not putting on a a waitress's outfit and then suddenly feeling like nobody knows who you are. Um, And then the last part that we didn't get to talk about now, but is important, which is action, because I think people need to know that they're not putting stuff into a black hole, that their thinking and their ideas are actually going to go somewhere. So people need to see action. If they're going to collaborate with you at any point of that phase, you better be doing something with it. Or if you're going to cut it, there better be a clear reason to cut it. But action is, I think, really important, too. Action slash communication. Mm, Tell me more about communication. Communicating back to the people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What you're doing. Yeah. You know, and not letting it go into the black hole. That's right. Nobody likes the yeah. black hole. It's a bad place. Yeah. Actually, nobody even knows what is really on the other side anyway, so it can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> I would go off on a Nothing science tangent. Nothing ever comes back out. So. I, know, I know. So we don't know. Actually, yeah. maybe it's glorious on the other side. We have no idea. All right, Jonah, <laughs> thanks for the question. Okay, before you tune out, Launch Streeters, here's what I want you to do. Super simple. I want you to give real collaboration – Remember, that's the right people at the table talking about the right things at the right time. I want you to give it a try. And I mean, really give it a try. And you may be thinking, yeah, but Tamara, I already do that. Maybe, but also maybe not. I often find when we work with clients, when we come in, that collaboration is really just a watered down version of consensus, which is why it's getting killed. So I want you to take real collaboration out for a test drive and then let us know how it went. What successes did you have? How did it change the momentum or create momentum? Now, one last shout out to Jonah for asking the question that so many of us are thinking but are so afraid to ask. Asking and taking that risk is part of innovating. Nice work. Tamara out. Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on GoToLaunchStreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to GoToLaunchStreet.com.